Well, thank you for uh, coming to this session. Uh, I don't know whether anybody else is uh, coming, but we will be recording it so that people who are not, not able to make it today uh, can still go to you know the presentation. And I um, will also make this presentation available through the introduction to online teaching class. And this is the rules you already know. <laughs> so mute, uh, switch between mute and unmute when you are talking. Find ad have an additional resources that is related to what we are talking about. Uh, feel free to share with us uh, in in the chat. And if we, we get disconnected, um, we will uh, rejoin using the same link. And we are talking about accessibility today. We have heard about accessibility uh, when Lisa was talking, but I'm going to probably go uh, a little more, a bit more to uh, technical details. Some of the things that we have uh, uh, just started, including a immersive reader. So if Stephen doesn't object to me talking about it, <laughs> we just uh, make this available, right, Stephen? Um, yeah, so. Well, so I, I've tried to make it available, but I have to <laughs> have to get permission from the, from the deans of that department to be able to make it available to anybody. Yeah, but it's just a good thing to, to know a bit about because uh, immersive reader is also available in Word, in the recent version of uh, Word. And we'll also talk a little bit about how to uh, get a closed captioning uh, for a video uh, in studio. And I'm actually pretty familiar with it in YouTube, but I'm just recently starting to use it in uh, studio as well. So we'll go to some of these uh, technical details about some of these accessibility features um, for um, Canvas for online courses. Um, so, first of all, why does it matter? Okay, why does uh, accessibility matter? Um, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, universal design, and then what can you do in your syllabus and uh, alternative representations, and then time for exams. These are a few um, heavy duty things we need to talk about for making courses more accessible in online courses. And then there are some minor things like such as color and contrast and font. And uh, we, we can have uh, some discussion about that as well. Um, so why, why does it matter? I have often heard from various people from uh, university access program, and I agree with them that universal design, if it is done uh, to the courses, it's just good design. It's good for everybody, okay? Not just for people who need special accommodations. And there are laws and regulations that require online courses to be more accessible. If there is one person in the class that needs special accommodations, so somehow that has to be provided uh, to the student. Uh, you know, usually it's uh, uh, the responsibility of the ADA compliant office, but the teachers can also do a lot to make the courses more accessible. As a matter of fact, there are things that, that the ADA compliance office may not be able to do, but you can do as a course teacher. And then there are a lot of assistive technologies right now that really make access, accessibility so much easier. So we all use uh, you know, certain uh, smart assistants in our homes, and this actually making things more accessible as well. So now let's talk about what is not accessible, okay? <laughs> like this watch, I'm trying to figure out this watch forever to how to set it to turn off the alarm, but I couldn't. Uh, <laughs> that's probably somebody with an engineering degree can, can figure that out. But, uh, you know, sometimes when, when you are designing things in a, in a way that is um, not accessible, really it makes things difficult for the users. When we are talking about ac accessibility and universal design, we really need to think about, you know, how to make things more user-friendly. So basically that's the main thing. So as we were saying a little bit earlier, if things are more universally designed, uh, using uh, universal design principles, uh, it is going to be useful by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation or specialized design. I, I think this means a lot. For, in, uh, for instance, if you are designing a ramp, uh, if you make this uh, um, accessible, then people who has a disability will appreciate it, but people who does not have better needs may also appreciate it. So when I go to a, a, a city with my son, 
he always talk about how accessible it is. Why does that matter to him? Because he didn't, doesn't need a special accommodation. But he used the uh, scooters and things like this a lot. And he just feel like which city is more accessible, which city is still less accessible. Sometimes, you know, their good design principle just makes things easier for everybody. Um, so th these are a few main principles for uh, universal design. It's equitable use, so people who need it and people who have special difficulties can all use it. And flexibility in use, this is a big deal. I think I find that there are lots of time, quizzes and exams are set in a very narrow window of time that um, you know people do not have a flexibility to take it any time while the clock is running, okay? Uh, we, we'll talk a, a little bit more about this later. And the design should be simple and intuitive. I have keep talking about, you know, how do you, how do you make your courses less cluttered? How do you reduce navigation to a bare minimum? That's another way to make it more um, accessible because it is more, it's simpler and it's more intuitive. And perceptible information, you cannot bury uh, these signifiers too deeply within your course, okay? And then this is really talked about by people, tolerance for error. And this also applies to quizzes too. Uh, sometimes people, you give them like, you know, from eight o'clock to eight and 10 to take uh, quizzes. You have to tolerate some of the errors in, in terms of, you know, the Wi-Fi is getting slow, people, the, the computer is just uh, somehow messed up. But of course, you also want to encourage them to be proactive in preparing for such things. Um, but, you know, things always happen. <clears throat> sometimes it's beyond individual students' control, even if they have taking all the necessary uh, low physical effort and the size and space for um, approach and, and you and in your syllabus I actually we, we actually require that put such a moment in the syllabus it's a good idea to um, put the ADA compliance statement in your syllabus and we actually have the the more updated version in our um, the template and if you ask us for it we can also give it to you and uh, one of the things that people often think about when talking about accessibility is uh, alternative representations. I mean, when you provide a student's information in a certain format, and people who cannot access it through that format, they should be provided alternative representation. So you were also, uh, you were often hear about alt text. I just start to use this alt text everywhere, just even in, in the PowerPoint. Okay, if I just uh, get out of my full screen view, um, you will see uh, I can actually click on something, click on the picture here, and I put a alternative text here. Did you see that? Screenshot from YouTube video showing the closed captioning function. So this are uh, actually uh, available even in Google Slides now. So if you just right click on it, it, you will, it will um, ask you to provide some kind of alternative representation there. In, in Canvas, when you are adding a, a picture, it is going to ask you for alternative text, right? So when you are just adding a picture, it is asking you for that. So try to describe that picture when you are adding a picture. Describe what it is. Imagine when you have a, a student who is blind, and then the student is going to have their JAWS program read that, that screen to them. When they hover over that picture, what does the picture tell them? Just imagine that scenario. When I was working in West Virginia uh, some years ago, I actually have a student worker who is blind and she actually review all the courses for us to make sure everything is, uh, is uh, compliant. And I actually learned quite a bit from, from, from her because she's in the same office and I can actually hear her jaws reading the things, uh, the screens to them. And one thing I, I also noticed that uh, their per screen reader program reads things very fast. I mean, they can adjust the, the speed of this, so it can re be read very fast. Another, um, so that's alt text. If it is a de uh, decorative image, and you, you do not have, a, you do not need to provide a detailed description of what that is about, you can just check to make uh, to mark it as a decorative image. Okay. Um, and then another alternative representation is you provide closed captioning for the videos, okay? If you have audio, I also think it's a good idea to the uh, 
a transcript available for students. Um, but you don't have to just listen and type everything. Right now, there are lots of technologies that can help you do that. Okay, I, I learned quite a bit about this while doing my um, interview transcription last summer. Okay, I just uh, transcribed all of this using a, a software. And it's actually working very, very well. Although it's con uh, kind of artificial intelligence enabled, it's not done by humans. Um, in terms of time, I think we, one thing to make things more accessible is to make quizzes. Uh, this is, I think this is kind of, re this kind of requests go to the university access program a lot, okay? Students need uh, more time for exams or they need additional time for, uh, and then they need extra attempts, things like this. Let's just show you how to, how that works uh, later on. And then there's color and font and etc. some minor details. I mean, if you have a table, it is a good idea to provide a table heading, a table for a chapter, just like what you do in writing an academic paper, so mark it clearly. And I generally found that time to contrast cannot be read by the screen reader. So cannot, you cannot depend on that entirely uh, for accessible. So if you really depend on contrast, then you know something needs to be uh, reconsidered. And also try not to use color to, uh, for emphasis because the screen readers uh, also have difficulty with the color. And uh, there are also people who are colorblind that needs to be thought of as well. And I don't know whether you noticed that or not, the Canvas de default font is sans serif fonts. I mean, the fonts without the little uh, hooks uh, in the corners, okay? Because when you blow up the screen, for some people just have a, a some people are just uh, visually challenged. They're not uh, uh, completely blind. So they can read something if you blow up the size a lot. But when you make the size very, very big, uh, it is said that the sans serif fonts are easier to read uh, on the screen when you magnify the screen, okay? So this, these fonts are, you know, Aria, Bordana, Helvetica, these are all working um, for this kind of purpose. Usually I just use the canvas font, default font, uh, because when you blew it up, it's still working fine. I mean, if you just uh, the magnify the, the size, it's still looking fine. And, and it is sans serif because Canvas has put a lot of effort into making their things accessible as well, okay? So I'm seeing a comment here. Also increase the speed of reading by using sans serif font. Uh, Stephen, can you comment more on that? I, 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 I don't know. So by, when you use a sans serif font versus, even if it's a non <coughs> universal design thing, you talked about that all, it raises all uh, boats, um, it'll increase, people's reading speed in a sans serif font versus a non sans serif. Um, the curly cues actually slow down your reading speed by about 10 to 15 percent versus uh, just a straight block <coughs> font. You can read much faster. Oh, that's fascinating. I, I, I didn't know that. So I didn't know that it has implications for reading as well. That's, 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 that's new to me. Thank you. And then the design considerations. I mean, as I always say, these are good principles anyway, whether it's uh, more um, we, whether we're considering accessibility or not. So it's always a good idea to chunk content. It's a good idea to make things modular and you repeat your pattern. If you have found something that works for you and you, uh, you need to provide a very clear structure in your course so that people can follow. Um, and also consider how people can get in and out of the, the, the pages. Because I yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Kendra. Can I ask a question about that? Sure, sure. So I routinely get feedback from students saying, we love how structured your classes are. They're, they know exactly when due dates are. It's always the same days every day of the week. We adjust for uh, university or um, um, federal holidays. But everything's very consistent. And so on the one hand, every, everything's very predictable. But on the flip side, I also get an equal number of students saying, we get bored so fast. So is there any way to, I want to keep it consistent and predictable because that's helpful, but at the same time, is there any way that I can spice it up a little bit? I don't know. 
is uh, actually, um, okay, hold on. I'm not eating, so let me tur turn my video back on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi. Sorry, I'm like totally <laughs> blown away from it. I was like, I'm not hearing this. Yeah. Um, I, I actually, Kendra and I have talked about this a lot, and I've thought about this a lot, and I see... I see great value in both students' responses. So on the one hand, I fully 100% understand the value in this pattern, you know, creating a pattern on a module and being consistent on the pattern because the lack of face-to-face -face interaction allows you, uh, the consistency of the pattern is a communication. It says, this is what's coming next. This is what's coming next. And they know that. And that's a way that you're communicating with them. On the other hand, the student who says, I'm bored, that would be me. That would have been me. I would have lost my marbles as an 18 to 22 year old <laughs> doing online classes that only were formulaic. I, I could not have done it just because that's not the way I'm wired. And so there is a part of me that has wondered and Berlin, speak to this because I don't know the answer. Um, what would be the value in creating your pattern of whatever it is, readings, a video, a quiz, and a discussion, whatever it is, and that just repeat throughout. And then at the beginning of the, let's say it's the long semester, let's say it's 15 weeks, that in the, at the beginning of the semester, you alert the students that on weeks three, six, nine, and 12, I don't know, there's gonna be a variation to the pattern and there's gonna be a completely different kind of an assignment. And that you lay that out up front so it's not part of the pattern, it's like this extra thing. Could that be somewhat of a happy medium perhaps? Yeah, um, I, I think Amy, thank you for, uh, for uh, answering this question. I have, uh, my thoughts about this is that, Kendra, you still have to persist in the, uh, in the uh, same pattern um, because these as uh, makes things more predictable for the students um, they were appreciated more once they go to a course that is not organized that way <laughs> so there are students who will feel completely lost where to go or they just uh, you know fish for things uh, from files uh, so uh, I, I mean I will still encourage you to stick to that pattern However, introduce some variety in the way you present your content, okay? Uh, for instance, uh, some can be, um, for, if you go to my introduction on online teaching, you will see that I use a mind map sometimes in my presentation. I just pull up my uh, iPad, it's the same. You also see a video. Every week I have several videos, but some weeks I, the, the video is produced by me talking, or sometimes uh, it's a video that, that is uh, me trying to show some PowerPoint. Sometimes the video can be a video of you using um, uh, some kind of mind mapping software. And there are some, uh, some other um, free sites that can spice up your content. Like, you know, h5p.org provides lots of things that students can use to interact with the content. Okay. Um, and, and this is um, something free that you can, that you can use. Okay. So uh, just think of more ways to present your content. And another way, you know, as some people are doing, just maybe just bury some Easter eggs uh, in your content. <laughs> so some, I know some people have been doing this. So there are different ways you, you can do this. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I understand the, uh, um, the students complain about um, how the, the format can be, can be boring. Um, but I mean, it's a lesser evil, in my opinion then you know disorganized disorganization uh, but I also I mean you can work on the, the content itself to make it more um, jazzy I don't know what how you call it uh, spicy yeah <laughs> so that's, that's I can do my video it. lectures with jazz hands <laughs> yes yes your videos are great by the way so I love all your videos yeah yeah um, so accessibility technologies let's talk a little bit about the uh, technology test moderation uh, I am going to actually show you one of those so I'm not going to repeat this uh, this uh, slides, um, but I would like to mention that the Siri and Alexa, things like this, are actually things that can make things more accessible because it's a change. It, it uh, directs people's uh, uh, perception from visual, merely visual, to audio and other you know ways. Okay, 
in uh, screen magnification, on screen keyboards, etc. I mentioned a little bit of screen reader such as JAWS uh, that is actually used by a uh, lot of people who has a visual challenges to access information. Uh, and, and now let me talk a little bit about several of the technologies that um, we haven't talked about uh, a lot. Okay. Okay, but before we do this, I'm going to cover um, uh, the quiz timing, okay? The, I sometimes find it difficult to, to explain uh, how the time works in Canvas for a quiz. I don't know whether that's your difficulty or not. But Canvas has three types of times. On the left, you will see there, there's a clock time. So once people start it, they have 15 minutes. It does not matter when they start. In the, mid, in the middle, you will see the available from and until. You can make a, a, a quiz or um, some assignment uh, available during a longer period of time than 15 minutes, okay? You can, you can make it available from the morning to the evening. Or as I heard um, somebody mentioned last time, it's a good idea to make it available 24 hours. It's Amy, you said that, right? So at 24 hours, um, so that people do not have an excuse anymore. So 24 hours that you will find time one way or the other to take the quiz. I, I usually do, I think I, most of my quizzes exams will open Wednesday morning at 8 a.m. and they close, and this is the week, 15 week semester, and they close 11.59 uh, p.m. on the Friday. So they have essentially 50-ish hours to pick. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so some, this can get some people very nervous. So they have all this time to take it. But if you set the available, you set the time limit here, that means that once they start it, the clock will be running, okay? And then actually they have- Lynn, when I, the reason that um, I said something about 24 hours is I had read several things on the pod listserv that talked about 24 hours that, that um, especially in this kind of remote time, which maybe is not as applicable to what you're talking about currently, Okay. Um, a 24 hour window that includes when your class time would normally be allows for students that literally would be in China or somewhere that the, that the day is night and the night is day. Yes. Um, and so I thought that was a really fair way to look at it. The, the rationale for giving 24 hours. I thought that yes. was pretty good. Um, Amy, I think that uh, applies also to regular online teaching as well. Um, due to the uh, time difference, the time zone, things like that. Um, and also, some people um, consider the scenario of students working, uh, if it is, goes several days, like a discussion boards, you make it across the weekend as well, so that people have time to work on things when they are not working, okay? So that's another thing to consider. So that is another way to make uh, your course more accessible, you, by making it more flexible. And then you, you moderate quiz, you can, you can tell that uh, you can ex add, add on additional time for specific students, usually double the time. Um, I, I think that's some kind of a general rule that the uh, university access program has been using, so double the time. So that's, you, can ch you can give people additional attempts as well if there's a, need, if there's a need to. But I would not know whether it is a good idea to advertise that <laughs> broadly because the people can abuse that uh, too. So I don't want um, to, 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 to broadcast that. Um, oh, I'm sorry. So they, I think I got lost for, from this screen. Um, are you still seeing, seeing it? Okay. Um, another way to make things more accessible is you just uh, turn your uh, audio to text. I mean, if you're doing audio, it is really a good idea to provide a transcript. Um, okay, I, I don't know whether you have that experience, but I often I hear people leaving a voicemail on my phone. I listened to several times and I could not get it <laughs> because they didn't read their names. I have no idea. They, 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 uh, they say their names very fast or their phone numbers very fast. I couldn't get it. I've listened to it several times. So that's when I wish, you know, there's some kind of a transcript for me. Um, but, you know, providing a transcript for audio, it is now much easier than the past. So if you use a Google Doc, uh, you just uh, 
uh, turn on um, voice typing from tools, it is actually automatically transcribing things for you. Okay, if you speak um, kind of articulately and slowly. Um, and uh, if, uh, if you are doing an interview, things like this. See, I use a software called Tammy, T-E-M-I dot com to transcribe things for me. It, it is not free, by the way, but it's not costing much either. Uh, it's for instance, for like a, a 30 minute um, interview, uh, it is going to cost $3, okay, for me. Uh, it's a machine transcribe. The cool thing about this is it's going to divide uh, into the people who are the interviewer and the place with two people talking, it's automatically dividing things up. So that really makes it very easy. Um, but if you are just talking, uh, if you are just producing a lecture of you talking only, there might be free software, including Google Doc, that work equally well, that can produce the kind of um, a transcript that you need, okay? Uh, so once you finish, you know, your audio recording, you just uh, run it through uh, Google Doc and uh, let, let Google Doc transcribe it for you. So I think that's her. If Stephen discover <laughs> some other tools, let me know, okay? Maybe the, what I'm telling you is um, kind of basic already. So um, I always depend on uh, Stephen to find um, better tools. <laughs> um, okay, um, this is what take me away to the uh, Tammy site, I think. Um, let me just go try to go to, and now I'm going to show you how to uh, produce, a, how to produce a transcription in studio, because when I'm, uh, I noticed that sometimes when I'm demonstrating through this meeting, it doesn't work so well. So I just recorded a video first. So I'm going to play this video. It's kind of short. I hope it works. Give me one minute. I'm going to play it. you how to create closed captioning for your videos in studio. Once you load up your video in Canvas, there are four tabs here, details, comments, insights, and captions. And captions is what you need to get the closed captioning started. So you will see there's a captions request here, that allows you to request automatically generated closed captioning. Okay, you can also upload your uh, transcript if you have something written beforehand. I am going to request an automatic captioning for this video. So I am going to choose my language, English, request it and it is being queued. Uh, once it is done, you should receive an email in your mailbox. Now it's still being queued. So I am going to pause a little here. Okay, after a while, the closed captioning is being created and it's going to show review and publish. So I am going to click on that and then it will show the uh, automatically generated closed captioning for you, okay? And if you see something wrong with it, you just uh, edit it here. And then you click on publish and it will be published. But here you can just um, edit it. And then you can just publish it. I may need to refresh this page for the closed captioning to show up. Now you see that the closed captioning is showing up now. So if you click on it, to English, and when you play this, I'm record right now, so probably I should name it slide one. The uh, closed captioning is appearing now. Okay, so that's um, so. Okay, I I I, I uh, that's that's how it works. Pretty simple. So i um, You probably have uh, tried that already. Uh, have you? I'm just curious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's very easy to 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 use, and you can do the same with uh, uh, YouTube videos as well. Um, I noticed that when you just put a video from YouTube into Canvas into a Studio, uh, closed captioning does not work. 
uh, in studio. <laughs> Basically, you will have to uh, do the uh, closed captioning in YouTube. Okay, the source at the source. Um, but it's the same process. I mean, YouTube is also automatically generated generate a, a transcription for you too. So that that's how you gen generate this automatically. I just found it pretty accurate, actually. I mean, eighty five to ninety percent. Uh, that the reason I was reading very slowly. I mean, talking without a vicar. <laughs> it's because I talk very slowly because I want. I really hope that the, the studio can pick up my sound clearly. So because I have to train myself to talk in a certain way so that uh, the transcription can be more accurate. So that's what I noticed. So well, well, if I'm talking very fast, then it, it does not work that well. Um, okay, uh, this is a screen that shows you that uh, when you request a transcription from studio, studio will send you an email saying this is done. So do not feel like that you have to wait, okay, a long time. I edited my little video just now, uh, that you just saw to, uh, I cut out all the pauses in the middle, otherwise it, it can take, take a while, I, I'm telling you, to, for the, uh, the transcription to be sent, okay, depending on how large, uh, how long your video is, okay. And I would, would not worry about it, I would just go to something else, and when it's done, they will send you an email, okay. And when the email is done, you can go back and check it. Um, and now let's talk a, a little bit about immersive reader. Um, okay, let's just go to Canvas and I will show you there what how immersive reader actually work. Okay. Um, thanks to Stephen uh, who has turned this to turned this on. I think I can see it now. But it's, uh, the immersive reader is something um, I think launched by uh, Microsoft. They put it in uh, all their cloud-based Microsoft applications. So if you go to your um, your Word, uh, your Office 360, five, 360 or six, I don't know, uh, the, you will see that uh, Immersive Reader is automatically there that you can use, or OneNote. Um, but it's also uh, available in Canvas as a free trial. Uh, I'm not uh, guaranteeing this will stay there. It depends on how much they will charge. Is that correct? Um, so I, I think right now it's uh, we are using the free version. And they offer it uh, for us to, to try. So if you go to um, an immersive reader thing, um, okay, I, I need to log into my Canvas, and I will show you how, how this works, okay? It's kind of cool, uh, actually. Um, let me go to another course, there's more content. Rapid online teaching course. Uh, it is uh, immersive reader, it's shown up where there is a, a content page, except somehow the, on the entry page, it does not seem to be showing. Um, so if I go to overview for module, if I have turned on the uh, immersive reader, and I'm gonna show you how it works. You see, there's a little icon now called immersive reader. You can turn this to on, you can click on it. Um, it, it will read the screen for you. So one of the options is it is going to uh, to um, to read. Okay, you see there's a little play button here. Overview for module one. Objectives. In this module, we will share some articles. Okay, so that, that is uh, uh, allowing students to listen to your content. Uh, another option is you can just customize the, the, the font, the way the font is presented to you. You can make it smaller or bigger, magnify. This is why you need sans serif fonts because when uh, very big, it, the, it still keeps the all the um, all the font in its original proportion. Um, and you can increase the spacing or not. Now it's uh, more condensed to each other. So actually, I like this better. And there are a number of fonts you can choose. Look at this. You can now use uh, Comic Sans now <laughs> in courses. I'm, I'm sure there are lots of people who like that and lots of people who also hate that. My, my, son, my son, Andrew, would be highly offended. He thinks that Comic Sans is just an embarrassing joke of a font. <laughs> it's some huge issue for him. I don't know for what, whatever reason, this is one of the favorite fonts um, by teachers. That's so funny. Yeah, <laughs> so it, it is, uh, although it's like that, and people like it. 
people like using it. You can also change the background and the way you read it. I just found this to be uh, pretty helpful because sometimes with white background, the glare is going to hurt an eye if people stay too long on the screen. Uh, maybe you can change the, uh, uh, the way it is uh, presented to you. So these are all things you can change. Um, now you can click on grammar options. It is also going to mark nouns, verbs, adjectives, and adverbs. This can be good for language learners. And then um, there is a reading. Uh, I believe there's also an option for you to translate this uh, into another language. So I don't know where, where, where that option is. Oh, here, here it is. Okay, let's say I want to uh, see this in Chinese, okay? I can turn this to Chinese. Uh, you can do word by word. That means if you click on word, it's going to show you the language. I mean, this would be very helpful for, uh, for classes that have uh, you know, students from another country. Uh, you can also just, um, let me show you another thing. You can also translate entire document. See, now somehow this is uh, in Chinese. I don't think the translation is very good, but it is give people the gist of it, okay? That was what I was gonna ask you. Is the translation very good? <laughs> well, actually, let me see. Uh, it's kind of off, kind of off. Okay, I'm telling you. So this is a, uh, it's just like a automatic transcription uh, by uh, Tammy. This needs somebody to edit it, okay, before it can, can be used. But it can, for very beginners, they can just actually uh, get uh, the main idea. It can help them a little bit. And, and people will understand that the translation is not perfect, okay? I, I think that's, that's the thing. They will understand the trans translation is not perfect there. Um, but this is, this is uh, available for you to, to use now. So I, let me just turn this back to, okay, back to English. But the cool thing is it's just uh, switching back and forth if you decide to, uh, to use it, okay? Um, that's, that's the uh, um, immersive reader. I also think that it's available in some other um, applications like um, Word, OneNote, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so that, that's, that's pretty cool, yeah. Um, some people are very excited about the option, but some people are not as excited about this. So it's, it's um, you know, it's really, it depends on the needs. I, I mean, um, Lisa's office probably would appreciate having this as one of the options. Um, I personally enjoy hearing some of the content uh, rather than just uh, reading it all the time. Have, have you noticed that uh, lots of uh, things now can have things read to you? Um, I recently just started to enjoy listening to the Bible rather than reading the Bible because when I'm walking, I can just listen. I can just um, put the play on and start to listen to it. So that's really uh, something convenient for me, yeah. And that's, that's it. I mean, that's all we, we have, I have for today. Any other ideas about, about accessibility that you think I should have covered that I haven't? Um, <laughs> um. I have a question. So I ran, I ran into a situation in my 15 week classes. I have uh, the students do a group video project together and I had a student with um, um, health issues or um, uh, things that required accommodation and she was not able to speak in the video. And so I just wanted to kind of see, uh, I mean, I worked with her, I worked with uh, university programs and we were able to come to a, con a conclusion, but any thoughts on something like that? So, Susan, who cannot speak? Um, I'm, I'm, I, I'm just thinking about, you know, uh, I haven't talked about the product you know, technology for um, turning text to speak, to speech. So I know that uh, with the immersive reader, you can, you can read. Uh, so that's going to be a, like so, some kind of a artificial voice added to the video. So that is possible. So somebody can help maybe generate that, maybe that have that student uh, type certain things, write certain things, and let the immersive reader uh, read that and record that and in, in, insert into the into the, uh, the video. I don't know whether that's a solution you can consider or not. Um, 
there might be other tools for uh, that produce uh, text for, from text to to audio, um, but I haven't found found a free one yet. It usually costs some money um, to purchase. Yeah, yeah. The immersive reader, and you can have immersive reader read it, and then uh, use Audacity or GarageBand to record it into an audio clip, and that can be inserted in, into that video. I mean, maybe you, have, you have, can have the students work on that, their groups yeah. work on that. There's lots of technologies. You can use Adobe Rush to move an MP3 file to an MP4, right? Oh, okay. Uh, is that right, uh, Stephen? I, I don't know. Uh, I'm not very familiar with Adobe Rush. Yeah. I know you can in Premiere. I have not tried to do that in Rush yet. I think some of my students are um, in my environmental thought class did that with some uh, uh, their MP3s. Yeah, I, I just haven't tried to do it. So I don't, uh, I know that there's file conversions in Premiere that work very well, but I have not tried to, I just haven't tried to do it in Rush. I couldn't speak to that specifically. Okay. Uh, you, if you're talking about conversion from uh, MP4 uh, to MP3, um, then you can actually uh, use uh, something called Smart Converter. Uh, they can convert an MP4 into MP3. Uh, it's free software. Um, that, that's what I use a lot. Yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts? Thank you for uh, helping us out again, Berlin. Thank you so much for attending. Okay. Uh, you take care, and I will record it, and uh, the link will be shared uh, at Adam Center site, or Vimeo site. Thank you so much, everybody.